Hello and welcome back to a personal code of conduct. My name is Dio and this week I was hoping to do something special. I wonder if I'm going to be competent trying to do it because everything is just very like, I don't know. Let's just say I got crazy, fucking crazy about like this particular thing. I got crazy about this particular video by CGP Grey. Um, the rules for rulers and i even though i know that this whole thing starting to see a reaction podcast i wanted to do something special by like, trying to cut out the audio and not just talking about it and linking to it like cut out the audio talk about different sections but i was like what is the technical way to do it especially since the way i'm lazy i haven't arranged my systems but whatever that's enough of that so a personal code of conduct i'm going to be talking about how that video like really really like i don't know for some reason even though people say it's depressing it kind of gave me hope it gave me hope that we are moving forward so i'll be discussing the video like basically as an impression now this is not any fact i do not know anything about like laws and economies and all those things like i'm one of those assholes who have read one book and wants to feel things i'm and maybe in like in the near future i'll probably find myself deleting a lot of things the podcast because of like maybe political ambition political ambition or business ambition and i might get cancelled for something so i might have to like listen to podcasts cut it out and replay it or whatever but here this personal code of conduct i'll be talking about my experience like what i feel it's not necessarily facts what i feel in my limited knowledge of history my lack of dedication to research <laughs> my lack of dedication to research but using that on what i generally feel about um where i think nigeria is and how the rules for rulers affects us because it just made everything feel so clear but remember, remember this is just one youtube i'm probably going to get that um dictator's handbook and it's going to end up being like one of those books that i still haven't finished after all these years but like, it'll be fine so we begin and hopefully if i do the editing right i'll be able to just like add on so we begin with we begin with the video then after i give a decision after you listen to that part of the video i give my reaction to it just so that there'll be some periods of like fantastic quality then there'll be my tacky quality after that do you want to rule do you see the problems in your country and know how to fix them if only you had the power to do so well, you've come to the right place. But before we begin this lesson in political power, ask yourself, why don't rulers see as clearly as you, instead acting in such selfish, self-destructive, short-sighted ways? Are they stupid, these most powerful people in the world, or is it something else? The throne looks omnipotent from afar, but it is not as it seems. Take the throne to act, and the throne acts upon you. Accept that or turn back now before we discuss the rules for rulers. I must have heard the first section. The first section of this entire thing talks about like why because at first sometimes we'll be having this conversation where we think oh the government is just stupid like watching this video just made me realize they're not stupid like how would you seize power over 200 million people if you were fucking stupid it doesn't work that way people are able to manipulate large groups of people are not stupid so why would they make decisions that that is crashing our currency preventing us from growing and you and this video answers a lot of questions for me in that kind of situation, at first I used to go the whole, oh, I, I want to rule, I want to improve, I want to improve myself, I know that kind of situation, and I want to be like the savior of my nation. But like this video answered that question, I was like, really? Are you going to be the savior of your nation? How are you going to go about it if that is possible? And that is fine. And it made me realize a lot of people that were hailed as heroes in history are fucking bullshit. It's like, yeah, they had um lofty plans but sometimes once you realize something is not enough and it's more important to share the resources with your guys is it doesn't matter it and it's more important to share the resources with your guys it doesn't the people become second because how are you going to help the people in the first place if you are go, if you are going to lose power the people become second fiddle i feel like this thing will explain so much and i can't even give like reasonable commentary but i'm going to try but then again it's a personal code of conduct and i just wanted to show anybody who listens to this something cool <laughs> Um, what else? Oh, yes. Do, at first, during our, like, era of dictatorships, like, the first... During our era of dictatorships, like, we had a lot of, um, coups. It was never, ever stable. Just revolutions everywhere. And the thing is, there wasn't... And everybody... And my mother used to tell me, whole, like, stories about everybody. I was like, 
like the moment you hear the national anthem on tv there has probably been a coup and i can't imagine living in that sense like we might say like the country is fucking stupid and we're having a lot of insecurity insecurity is insane in this country but i live in a southwestern state in a massive city where our requirements we as far away from the oil and gen- self-generating enough wealth that the oil in the south is in the south south doesn't necessarily matter to us so a lot of the things i have generally even though the city and the city has been cleaned up a lot relatively but it's it's a middling level of stability and that is where I, i'm currently coming from and i realize that all countries are similar to this situation but that's like an intro this is an intro then the when we go on to the after one we we'll go on to the rule one and rule two no matter how bright the rays of any sun king, no man rules alone. A king can't build roads alone, can't enforce laws alone, can't defend the nation or himself alone. The power of a king is not to act, but to get others to act on his behalf, using the treasure in his vaults. A king needs an army and someone to run it, treasure and someone to collect it, law and someone to enforce it. The individuals needed to make the necessary things happen are the king's keys to power. All the changes you wish to make are but thoughts in your head if the keys will not follow your commands. In a dictatorship where might makes right, the number of keys to power is small, perhaps only a dozen generals, bureaucrats, and regional leaders. Sway them to your side and the power to rule is yours, but never forget, displease them and they will replace you. Now, all countries lie on a spectrum, from those where the ruler needs few key supporters to those where the ruler needs many. This foundation of power is why countries are different, yet many keys or few, the rules are the same. First, get the key supporters on your side. With them, you have the power to act. You have everything. Without them, you have nothing. Now, in order to keep those keys to power, you must second control the treasure. You must make sure your treasure is raised and distributed to you for all your hard work and to the keys needed to keep your position. This is your true work as a ruler, figuring out how best to raise and distribute resources so as not to topple the house of cards upon which your throne sits. Now you, aspiring benevolent dictator, may want to help your citizens, but your control of the treasure is what attracts rivals, so you must keep those keys loyal. But there's only so much treasure in your vaults, so much wealth your kingdom produces, so beware. Every bit of treasure spent on citizens is treasure not spent on loyalty. Thus doing the right thing, spending the wealth of the nation on the citizens of the nation, hands a tool of power acquisition to your rivals. Treasure poured into roads and universities and hospitals is treasure a rival can promise to key supporters if only they switch sides. Benevolent dictators can spend their take on the citizens, but the keys must get their rewards, for even if you have gathered the most loyal, angelic supporters, they have the same problem as you, just one level down. Being a key to power is a position of power. They too must watch out for rivals from below or above. Thus, the treasure they get must also be spent to maintain their position. The loyal and dim may stay by your side no matter what, but smart key supporters will always watch the balance of power, ready to change allegiance if you look to be the loser in a shifting web of alliances. In countries where the keys are few, the rewards are great, and when violence rules, the most ruthless are attracted, and angels that build good works will lose to devils that don't. So buy all the loyalty you can, because loyalty in dictatorial organizations of all kinds is everything for the ruler, anyway. Thus, the dictatorship exposed, a king who needs his court to raise the treasure to keep the court loyal and keep raising the treasure. This is the self-sustaining core of power, all outside 
is secondary. Now, a king with many key supporters has real problems. Not just their expense, but also their competing needs and rivalries are difficult to balance. The more complicated the social and financial web between them all, the more able a rival is to sway a critical mass. The more key supporters a ruler has on average, the shorter their reign. Which brings us to the third rule for rulers, minimize key supporters. If a key in your court becomes unnecessary, his skills no longer required, you must kick him out. After a successful coup, the new dictator will purge some of those who helped him come to power while working with the underlings of the previous dictator, which from the outside seems a terrible idea. Why abandon your fellow revolutionaries? Are the old dictator's supporters not a danger? But the keys necessary to gain power are not the same as those needed to keep it. Having someone on the payroll who was vital in the past but useless now is the same as spending money on the citizens. Treasure wasted on the irrelevant. And by definition, a dictator that pulls off a coup has promised greater treasure to those switching sides. The size of the vault has not changed, so the treasure must be split among fewer. A dictator that sways the right keys, takes control of the treasure, cuts unnecessary spending, kills unnecessary keys, will have a long and successful career. Seeing the structure unveiled, you might be excited to get started and control a country to the benefit of you and your cronies, or you might be exhausted, wishing to do good but seeing the structural difficulties now turn to democracy for salvation. So let us discuss rulers as representatives. So, next one. Rule one, get the key supporters. I feel during our dictatorship period, it was always members of the military council that were the key supporters. I remember this conversation about this individual who was a member, who like found out about a coup, reported to his supervisor, not knowing that his supervisor was sticking the plot of the coup. And then when another coup happened, he didn't say anything. He didn't report to his supervisor and he was beheaded. And he was, his logic was just plain and simple that a coup was about to happen. When I reported to the coup, what did I get? I got two weeks of suspension and torture. And uh, do you expect me to report this one? Ashe, the, the, new coup, the new coup actually cost him his life because the people who were going to be cooed against managed to keep their position in power and slaughter the people that were plotting against them. And that's because of our treasure. What is Nigeria's treasure? Oil. 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 Fucking oil. Of course it's oil. And I remember having um, this conversation with somebody. Like, we were on track to be a stable democracy based on agriculture. Our entire flag is green, white, green, and we are nothing of those things. Like, we are literally barely growing food, and we are barely growing, like, we barely have water. Uh, no, no, sorry, white is not for water, it's for peace. There's no peace. People, are, at least we've stopped. There are no more bombings, but there are now aggressive amounts of bandings that are kidnapping. So we are no longer facing the bombing issue. Because bombings, I don't know, whoever is like was in charge of the bomb, bombings, bombings are bad for your like national ratings generally. And in that kind of situation, I remember having this, conver- I wasn't a conversation, it was this lecture by this older man, and he was talking about like the discovery of oil and how it's damaged our education system like when you suddenly have so much money and a resource that you control via dictatorship because it was the tapping of oil happened immediately after that period where like after the war after the war and a lot because we had and that's another thing we faced as a third world country as a middling democracy or a middling dictatorship trying to get it up you are at the mercy of foreign powers and people's ambition often helps them sell people sell the souls of their of their citizens to the devil. It wouldn't shock me if we eventually get sold to China as slaves at this way. But like it can go either way. I'll go I'll I'll get back to it later. So when we're looking at like the experience of oil and having oil as our main source of treasure, somebody was they literally see schools from from like missionary, from churches, from every situation and put them mass building schools but the things they didn't want to pay teachers the way teachers were paid our currency was collapsing and they were busy taking the advice of foreigners who didn't have our best interest at hand because those foreigners wanted things it's just unfortunate and if you are at the position to be a victim so far you as an individual are well protected you often start to forget that as an entire race as an entire peoples you like especially 
the fact that humans all look different. As an entire people, you're getting all of us into fucking trouble <laughs> by accepting this deal that will like make you amazing and incredibly powerful just within your sphere of influence, but you become like a worthless near slave if you ever leave your fear, your sphere of influence. And that's like the story of us in on average. <laughs> Next, um, next was was talking about. I have like a horrible. I don't write scripts. Help, um, talk about war aid salvation. Oh yes, this reminded me. Like one section of the other section, I'm going to use in what I'm describing the row one and row two. It reminded me of a period in like Nigeria's history where a leader refused to get aid. Because getting getting war aid and resulting in a lot of children facing aggressive malnourishment and starvation, all because of and yet like the soldiers were well fed. Like the minimum when resources minimized, the focus was on keeping the armies and the people and everybody else well fed. And in the end, when they lost their coup, none of them died. None of the key people died. They were able to save their necks, save their bodies, save their lives on the like and that's just sad like powerful people all know each other like everybody just fucking knows each other people just want to lead they want power they want the resource and in the end when the blood of the of the of the foolish people the blood of the people who thought they had a hope the blood of the people who thought and the thing is if you are like you are several stages down in the hierarchy but you are not exactly like it's a starved commoner yeah you are more likely to die as the state escape goes then the form the commoners will die in the millions of starvation and suffering yet the people who are actually fighting that's why i feel like nobody really hates each other hate is hate is is something for the poor and the middle class hate is not for the powerful <laughs> it's just like are you do you currently fit into my plans that kind of situation uh we'll be fine So, I think that's that's it for this section. I'll play another section if I remember how to properly arrange it. You, again, might have grand dreams of the utopia you wish to build, but no man rules alone, and never more so than in democracy. Presidents and prime ministers must negotiate with their senates and parliaments and vice versa, and they all have their own key supporters to manage. In a well-designed democracy, power is fractured among many and is taken not with force, but with words, meaning you must get thousands or millions of citizens to, if not like you on a election day, at least like you better than the alternative. With so many voters and such fractured power, it's impossible to, as a dictator would, follow these rules and buy loyalty. Or is it? Of course not. Don't think of citizens as individuals with their individual desires, but instead as divided into blocks. The elderly or homeowners or business owners or the poor. Blocks you can reward as a group. Democracies have wildly complicated tax codes and laws not as accident but as reward for the blocks that get and keep the ruling representatives in power. Farming subsidies, for example, have nothing to do with the food a nation needs but entirely with how key the vote of the farming block is. Countries where farmers' votes don't swing elections don't have farming subsidies. If a block doesn't vote, such as younger citizens, then no need to divert rewards their way. Even if large in number, they are irrelevant to gaining power. Which is good news for you. One less block to sway, and the treasure you give your key blocks has to come from somewhere. If you want long years in office, rule three is your friend in a democracy just as much as a dictatorship. You can't eliminate those who don't vote for you, but there is still much you can do. Once in power, make it easier for your key blocks to vote and harder for others. Establish voting systems that reduce the number of blocks you need to win the more rivals you get. Very handy indeed. Draw election borders to predetermine the results for you or your cronies, and have party pre-elections with Byzantine rules to determine who blocks even can vote for. Mix and match the above for even better power perpetuation. When approval ratings couldn't be lower, yet re-election rates couldn't be higher, you'll know you've succeeded. Now, enough with thinking about the citizens. Even in a democracy, there still are very influential individual key supporters you need on your side, because their money or influence or favors keeps you in power. 
While you can't just promise to give them treasure directly, as a dictator would, you can create loopholes for their investments, pass laws that they've written, or print get-out-of-jail-free cards for their actions. Not a wheelbarrow of gold to the door, but contracts for their business. You as a ruler do have roads to build, or computers to maintain, or buildings to reconstruct. No man rules alone, after all. Or you could take the moral path and ignore the big keys, but you'll fight against those who didn't. Good luck with that. Corruption is not some kind of petty crime, but rather a tool of power in democracies and dictatorships. But more on that another time. So accept the favors, sway the key blocks, and you will get into power, ruling with actions that look contradictory and stupid to those who don't understand the game, privately helping a powerful industry you publicly denounced, or passing laws that hurt a block that voted for you. But your job isn't to have a consistent, understandable ruling policy, but to balance the interests of your keys to power, big and small. That is how you stay in office. Now, with all this headache of being a representative, you may wonder, looking at Rule 3, why couldn't you skip all this block-building, favor-trading nonsense and just bribe the army to take power? We must finally turn to taxes and revolts. Do you know the reason why I think like Nigeria is never going to collapse anymore? Why I think that we are not going to be in like, serious trouble anymore? Because I feel... Why we are not going to be in like serious trouble anymore? Why I feel like we are going to continue? Like why I feel like our democracy is not going to collapse? Shall I tell you why? <laughs> I should tell you why. Um, I think this is because, um, for one, the keys have become too many. The keys have just become too many. There is it's no longer a situation of the military council controls everything. There are too many people with access to weapons, access to all sorts of things that they've not been able to get to because after democracy like a country that has gone through a lot of military coups then you did the normal thing as we have weakened our military unfortunately which has resulted in a lot of like civilian politicians heart um arming like because i this can have a conversation of like random hood people because i literally because it's funny when you see things in a micro scale because obviously these rules of power ascertain to like normal neighborhood gangsters that terrorize the entire place that ensure but they can be wiped away. All their power can be destroyed by a foreign entity. And for the most part, if they're a neighborhood gang, it's often if the city police are, are above is given, if the mayor or whoever is in, has more power than them, that is beyond their micro scale, decides that they are too much of a nuisance and they need to be destroyed, it's easy for them to be destroyed. Right now, Nigeria has too many keys to power. As shaky and as shitty as our democracy is, I think it's going to last. I don't know whether it's going to strengthen, but I think it's going to last. Now, when I was looking about the concept of like voters block, what is the key blocks in this country? Like us young people that we claim to be the hip Twitter people, but us annoying Twitter people don't vote. I'm an annoying Twitter person. Okay, I don't use Twitter. I don't use anything. I just use Twitter to post links in space. And Twitter is still banned. And everybody has a fucking VPN about me. But, like, I don't want to go through the stress of getting a VPN so I can continue being a Twitter person when I only just used to post links to my podcast. But we don't vote. Like, I literally should go and get a voter's card. I know I should. Like, I had a bunch of free time. Even when I was working from home, I had the opportunity to get a voter's card. I should. I should go and get a fucking voter's card because I know that I register in my neighborhood, get my voter's card. Because voting in my neighborhood, like, the neighborhood I grew up in, it is fenced around. It literally has high walls. And I am not worried about... Like, I think they made sure that our neighborhood literally had one voter's box and people outside our neighborhood cannot vote in our voter's registration center. So there's, like, zero chance of there being a violent outbreak. And yet, it is still people in their 70s from my economic class that still take out the time to go and vote. <laughs> the VI people even vote, like like really wealthy people, do they even bother to vote? I don't think they do. It's like they don't because they don't need to. They they have they paid for the campaign. They 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 paid for the campaign. <laughs> so they don't need to vote. But us like us like regular mainlanders that live in estates that are children and we have children who rather be on the internet and pressing phone we are not a very useful voter block so the massive most useful voters block in nigeria is the mass of the poor and religion this is why 
power often rests in who can sway the northern vote. Remember, I am not any expert or anything. This is just me relating to a random YouTube video to my own country. Power rests on the individual that can sway the north because the middle class people who are who like are generally concentrated in cities in the south are not going to vote we are scared in our house and we are so few that we probably will not sway the election that is the thing we probably wouldn't sway the election and it's easier to maintain it because if you maintain a situation where you can give minimal amount of things to poorer people like so for, like that that's the conversation i kept on having with myself like if, for example, if you don't build any infrastructure, but your people do, are disconnected in their small town, no healthcare, no infrastructure, they are disconnected, focus on farming, and nothing ever affects them. But there will be wars because of that resource that used to open your country. And those people will be affected and in constant states of suffering. Now, if you are able to put, have an aggressive access to the resource, to the resource, if you have an aggressive access to the resource, and you are able to be a stable dictatorship, people often won't even have any idea that they are in a country. They'll just be living their normal, boring lives, farming their food and barely eating like the way they've always done. But the thing is not always like that. That resource needs to be sold to the outside world. And if it's sold to the outside world, world, there needs to be like, people will know what's going on and there will be attacks, there will be revolts, there will be people who loot, like things, the most violent men in the re- revolutionary are often like the neighborhood gangsters in the qu- in quotes because they are the ones that see the citizens as something they desire to have. That's, they are the ones that lead the rapes, the torture, the horror, the other things. But you that is educated enough, is literate enough, you just want the treasure so that you can travel fly in and out of your country and just exist and this made me realize that i think when we get to the other section because i don't think it's in this section but it's just like talking about the voters block in india you just need to win an election you need the northern poor to win because you are you hold them by the basis of religion you hold them by the basis of tribalism you hold them by the basis of oneness you owe them by like stupid promises and decisions the cocoa of the aura is that you get the active the active people the people who are willing to vote to vote for you and that is all i think that is all about our own like whatever with the democracy oh yeah like i wanted to mention like examples of how they did this like distribution of resources by land mass rather than population um, that is like often a resource distribution and shows you where the direction of power is. And they might say that, oh, is it because like of a larger landmass, we probably need to build more resources in that kind of situation. I think it was something similar. Um, but that was just like a resource distribution issue that kept like power in the north. But it's it's however it is. And funny thing is, the place that gets like most of the resource distribution very little of it actually reaches the citizens you can say like in er- even though areas like in the south gets like fewer of the distribution more of it reaches the citizens because more of the city because more of the south wealth wealth is, is not dependent on oil even though like unfortunately the entire country has a revenue sharing model and i'm just thinking that secession is not possible like it's simply not possible. We will not be able to, f- to fracture after the civil war. I don't expect another civil war because the one thing holding our country together is oil. And other people that do not have the oil will never let the people that have the oil to leave. Where the fuck are you living to? Because we are like we're operating on a, a relatively unequal revenue sharing model. But like it is a model that it is working. Like we are we are operating on shaky tribalism, but like it is a model that that lets I feel like I would dare say everybody cannot wait for 2023. Like, will there be an actual Eastern presidency? I don't know. I think my and my existence, I have an opportunity to vote in a safe environment. I should really go and get a voter's card and see what's going on. It's the thing is, it's probably going to be like nobody writes a manifesto and any plans. Like Nobody has a real plan for what... The, no, the thing is, they have plans. Like, this video made me realize they all have fucking plans. It's just, whatever they wrote in their freaking manifesto on the paper, that's probably not what they're going to do. But I don't think they want... I think we are on the road to a transition. What that transition is... Oh, I think I I have to go back to other sides. Anyway, distribution of resources, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yes, and... 
in that kind of sense, some people are becoming key key sections of power, key individuals of power. And somebody was talking about how um how people were talking about um how somebody has become a key situation. I was t- I, I kept on thinking about a refinery that is to be built in my country. And I, I keep on worrying because I think that is going to be suitable. It's going to help our currency if we can get like it has gotten to the point. A reason why I have hope because I have a feeling that it has gotten to the point that the key supporters no longer see enough profits by being at a um refined products um a refined products kind of country. They now see the profits in ensuring that there has always been profits in ensuring, but which one is easier for them to just split the treasure? But when we get to a point that there's so much key, key supporters, we are getting to the point that there must be more treasure for them to share. And for if there must be more treasure for them to share, the population needs to become productive. And I feel like definitely they are going to try and get that like um, refining money because the few key, key supporters were able to make money from sell, um, importing crude oil, um, selling crude oil and importing um what they call it importing refined products and that is no longer going to be suitable in the fact that that is no longer going to be suitable in the fact that there are too many key people in the situation and there is not enough treasure to go around so i think rather than that we are going through a situation where we are hoping to create more treasure rather than eliminate key people which is in my opinion and it's, it's amazing <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful thing so like our leaders are deaf, not stupid. It's just their focus is on their key supporters. And I like the fact that he said that democracies are not necessarily like filled with good people. The interests of the people are just luck- just luckily aligned with ensuring that the key supporters, the key individuals have their way. You must understand rule two and how the treasure is raised and used to hold the country together. If we graph the tax rate of countries versus the number of key supporters the ruler needs, there's a clear relationship. More democracy, lower taxes. If you're sitting comfortably in a cushy democracy, you may scoff at this, but you are fellow citizens who don't earn enough, don't pay income taxes, and get rebates, bringing the average tax rate down. In dictatorships, This doesn't happen. Dictatorships often forego tax paperwork in favor of just taking wealth directly. It's common for the dictator to force farmers to sell their produce to him for little, then turn around and sell it on the open market, pocketing the difference at an unthinkably high equivalent tax rate. So taxes in democracies are low in comparison to dictatorships. But why do representatives lower their take? Well, cutting taxes is a crowd pleaser. Dictators have no need to please the crowds and thus can take a large percentage from their poor citizens to pay key supporters. But representatives in a democracy can take a smaller percentage from each to pay their key supporters because their educated, freer citizens are more productive than peasants. For rulers in a democracy, the more productivity, the better, which is why they build universities and hospitals and roads and grant freedoms, not just out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it increases citizen productiveness, which increases treasure for the ruler and their key supporters, even when a lower percentage is taken. Democracies are better places to live than dictatorships, not because representatives are better people, but because their needs happen to be aligned with a large portion of the population. The things that make citizens more productive also make their lives better. Representatives want everyone productive so everyone gets highways. The worst dictators are those whose incentives are aligned with the fewest citizens, those who have the fewest keys to power. This explains why the worst dictatorships have something in common, gold or oil or diamonds or similar. If the wealth of a nation is mostly dug out of the ground, it's a terrible place to live because a gold mine can run with dying slaves and still produce great treasure. Oil is harder, but luckily foreign companies can extract and refine it without any citizen involvement. With citizens outside this cycle, they can be ignored while the ruler is rewarded and the keys to power 
kept loyal. Thus, we live in a world where the best, smartest democracies are stable, the worst, richest dictatorships are stable, and in between is a valley of revolution. The resource-rich dictators build roads only from their ports to their resources and from their palace to the airport, and the people stay quiet not because this is fine or even because they're scared, but because the cold truth is starving, disconnected illiterates don't make good revolutionaries. Now, a middling dictator without resources must, as mentioned before, take a large amount of wealth directly from his poor farmers and factory workers. Thus, two roads won't do and so he must maintain some minimums of life for the citizens. But keeping the workforce somewhat connected and somewhat educated and somewhat healthy makes them more able to revolt. Now understand, the romantic image of the people storming the gates and overthrowing their dictator is mostly a fantasy. If you run a middling dictatorship, the people only storm the palace when the army lets them to remove you because you lost control over your keys and are being replaced. This is why after popular revolts in middling dictatorships, the new ruler is often the same as the old, if not worse. The people didn't replace the king, the court replaced the king, using the people's protest they let happen to do it. The very things a benevolent dictator wants to build to cross this valley take treasure away from the keys to power and make the citizens more able to revolt, often ending in a stronger ruler less likely to build bridges and more loyal to his keys. On the other side, the best democracies are stable, not just because the large number of keys and their competing desires makes dictatorial revolt near impossible to organize, but also because the revolt would destroy the very wealth it intended to capture the high productivity of the citizens. Plus, those helping the would-be dictator in a democracy know he plans to cull key supporters once in power. That's what a coup is. So potential key supporters must weigh the probability of surviving the cull and getting the rewards versus the risk of being on the outside of a dictatorship they helped create. In a stable democracy, that's a terrible gamble. Maybe you'll be incredibly wealthy, but probably you'll be dead and have made the lives of everyone you know worse. The math says no. Being on the right side of a coup in a dictatorship means having the resources to get you and your family what the peasants lack. Healthcare, education, quality of life. This is what makes the competition for power so fierce. But in a democracy, most already have these things, so why risk it? So the more the wealth of a nation comes from the productive citizens of the nation, the more the power gets spread out and the more the ruler must maintain the quality of life for those citizens, the less the less. Now, if a stable democracy becomes very poor, or if a resource that dwarfs the productivity of the citizens is found, the odds of this gamble change and make it more possible for a small group to seize power. Because if the current quality of life is terrible, or the wealth not dependent on the citizens, coups are worth the risk. When democracies fall, these are usually the reasons. These rules for rulers explain not only why some men are monsters and others are merciful, but everything about politics, from war to foreign aid to political dynasties to corruption, all of which we can talk about at another time. But for now, you aspiring ruler may be disgusted by the world of politics and have decided to avoid it entirely. But you cannot, for rulers come in many forms. Yes, kings, presidents, and prime ministers, but also deans, dons, mayors, chairs, chiefs. These rules apply to all and explain their actions. From the CEO of the largest global corporate conglomerate who must keep his board happy, to the chair of the smallest homeowners association, managing votes and spending membership fees. You cannot escape structures of power. You can only turn a blind eye to understanding them. And if you ever want the change you dream about, there's a zeroth rule you cannot ignore. Without power, you can affect nothing. You may not like these rules, but surely better you on the throne than someone else. And who knows, maybe you'll be different. Cool.
continue on with my previous previous points like pre the entire video cutting like nigeria is currently facing a decline oil is no longer enough with our for our key supporters it's no longer enough to just split between the few people and i feel like our democracy our democracy as shitty as it is is getting stable a lot of northern leaders are realizing that you can no longer use religion to hold people down because it's making too many people have delusions of power like too many dictators that are satisfied with their tiny sphere of influence but have gone to cause a nuisance they're starting to pop up and that kind of situation we need to make people no longer susceptible to delusion to their to faith like it gets it said like everybody in like the southwest most majority of people of southwest often focus on they like they live just enough that faith is allows them to do irresponsible things with their personal lives and give irresponsible amounts of money to the church blindly follow um, a pastor that has zero psychological experience and any of those situations blindly follow his beliefs and they just do whatever like that is just how it is in southwest it isn't up to the point that people would kill for their god whether it's is enough it's more the religion religious control in the southwest is enough that people will judge people for their god will ostracize their own children for their god will make everybody miserable for their god but it is not enough that they will cause a disturbance and a breakdown of economic process because of their god but it is not the same for some individuals in the northern half of the our country. And people are starting to realize that there's just so much hard to be had in the world that you can no longer, it is not advisable to continue having that kind of loose canon as your electorate. So I feel like improvements are coming. Whether oh yeah, and the concept of foreign aid. I know this is off point and whatever, but when it comes to foreign nationals, like because everybody always the issue with dictators and the thing is they are always foreign nationals needing to trade with them. I have to mention it. I need to mention it, and I mentioned it several times before. Warlords only get like people always trade with the, in scattered countries. Whoever has access to the mine for the short period of time, they will find somebody to trade with them. But nobody ever like louds the facts that they trade with warlords. Nobody ever like hype. Okay let everybody know in public that they trade with warlords but like that's where diamonds are coming from i remember having this conversation it wasn't a conversation but we had a conversation in the commodity markets and we're having this conversation about how like everybody's talking about clean and sustainability and helping like the environment exists and all those kind of situations and like preventing human suffering when it comes to wealth and i was like a lot of these individuals who are like focusing on speaking and using words and appearing to be like kind or what have you there's not enough eyes on the commodity market if more individuals in the wealthier countries had their eyes on the commodity market traded actively on the commodity market people would it'd be easier to track it people would have more interest or need to trace but i don't know it's a question i'm yet to understand but i want to have a conversation with like experts in that field eventually which i feel like i'm in a position to eventually have that conversation like if we can advertise that period and ensure that um poorer countries have established commodities markets and those individuals who are insisting that they want clean diamonds actively know where the diamonds are coming from and make steps to trade and invest in like um invest in different stages of that trade like because obviously you can trade in raw di- not necessarily diamonds i think diamonds are whole. like you can trade in raw gold you can trade in raw copper and the thing is if people are moving aggressively investing in companies who get that raw copper but are also doing it in green branding you can't just do green branding at the end products if you can get more people interested in that is just a bullshit idea in my own head but if you can get more people interested in the commodities market you can get more companies at the upper end or like at the lower is it upper or lower end of the of the um, of the consumer chain marketing themselves as sustainable that is one thing when i'm thinking about sustainability market we should focus on rather than end products people being sustainable we should focus more on foundational products people being sustainable and if the foundation if and if investments and money is moving towards making the foundation sustainable naturally even the end product company don't even have to like go through any stress they will be sustainable because the foundational companies are sustainable and i feel like because i remember we are currently having this conversation on vat like lagos state generally has proven that 
you can aggressively internally generate money. And the fact that our population is booming and they like the thing is if population is growing aggressively, the amount of key supporters are going to increase because people will have people under them, under them, under them. And it's, that's why I feel Nigeria never had, because even though we're going through our crazy period of coups every fucking four years, it was never like bloody that people died on the streets. At least I know, like for the first, like after, it was mostly the coups happened in offices. It happened in the, with the natural, National Military Council. And maybe there were a short period of riots, like for a period, but it was never bloody. I don't know, I was not allowed to be during that period. But like everybody just knew, oh, when the national anthem came up, that'd be a cool. I won't even tell you a random story. My mom see she had this period where she just ran outside. Like it was just like our democratic president at that time, Good luck, Jonathan, giving a speech. But she ran outside so afraid. And I was like, what just happened? I was like, the president is giving a speech. And she was screaming. She was like, has there been a coup? She wanted to just start like locking up everything. Because like the moment there's a coup, people will try and break into like um, estate neighborhoods that have their fences high. Like until the army can calm things down in a couple of days. But she was but we're like, no, no, it's just the president. And for somebody who was born, because I was literally born like six months before our last dictator died, probably murdered by the US or whoever murders dictators. I should probably cause that. I won't because I've stated at the beginning, this is a baseless teenager. Like, okay, I'm no longer a teenager. Fuck, I'm 24. Okay, I'm not 24. How old am I? Jesu? I don't fucking know. What? Jesu? I'll be 24 next year. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Fuck. Ignore this baseless rumors by a 24 year old. I know nothing. I hope this thing doesn't get me cancelled. Like, by counsel, ruin my career and my entire entity as a human being. <laughs> but then again, we'll be fine. So, now that there's conversation towards taxation, people are starting to see there is money. There's still corruption. And it's, it's probably going to trick us more if our taxes are being stolen. Because a lot of people were able to handle the aggressive theft and pollution of waters and and ruining of lives in the south sides because it never really affected them oh it's just guys directly going from the resources to the airports like just infrastructure where the airport is and infrastructure where the resources is end of story and it just realized that all these foreign countries that give foreign aid they are not they are not like the royal shell dutch and, and all those people that are killing people and torturing people and ensuring all the children die and all this kind of situation. They don't give a damn. They never do it in their own countries. And that was what used to make people boil angry. But like, I just realized that racism is not like, nobody ever does anything because of, nobody important does anything just because of racism. There's something has to be gained. Like that's when you talk about like voter suppression and other things. Like there's something to be gained. Nobody, no key person in, like in a macro scale, I think macro is the right word, like micro scale, key people will obviously do things just for the sake of racism but like no people in a powerful scale would do shit just for the sake of racism unless maybe they are like a face an idiot that was just put in there as a figurehead and is deluding themselves that um they have power i don't know this is me um this is a stereotype i heard somewhere about like regan that he was just deluding himself that he had power but he was just a puppet oh god why are you putting questionable things on the internet i don't know me i don't know the country i denounce that statements even though i'm keeping it here um what else we're going on to oh yes the other parts the last part actually anyways i'd say that because okay, I've already played the end, the end one. And I'd say that this entire thing gives me hope. I know it's a weird thing for somebody in a third world country to say. But this entire freaking thing gives me hope. I was like, it, it just gives me hope. Because we are currently on that very precarious. Okay, I, can't, I want to keep on. I, I haven't Googled the word, the word precarious. It has been on my head since. Uh, if I find the meaning, I will probably find a way to use it sometimes this week. Like properly. But we are be we are on this very rickety bridge that's supposed to take us to the world of a stable democracy, like the entire world of the powerful can continue to do their crazy shit and be their dynasties. Like until you look at like highly political countries, you notice that oh my god, like this is a family business. There are dynasties in this thing, but like. In a stable democracy, you can have your happy, mediocre dreams. You can even have maybe up to like a hundred million dollars 
and not ever be a key person in anybody's story. Just be a me- like you won't be key in anybody's story. Just a mediocre, like you just have like the ability to enjoy the world without having to play this game of politics. The free ability to ignore power. But I don't think you can have a hundred million dollars in a third world country like Nigeria and not be a key it doesn't make any sense you have to play on the macro scale if not why are you even going to find that 100 billion dollars but like that is where i want nigeria to get to i want us to be a stable democracy so i can turn a blind eye to the upper classes because at that point the upper classes will simply not affect me i will have education for my if i ever chose to have children i'll have education the best quality of education the best health care and the best everything i wouldn't even have to think about who is ruling what or if there's corruption or if anything is going on but the problem is that the developed countries that currently have this situation it's a question of world is that there's still world trade and though a lot of they often have to do a lot of horrible things outside their borders to maintain this internally i but i have the delusion that if every i this one i'm using the word delusion because i'm not sure if it's possible but if every country was a stable democracy they can continue to have this their powerful world in place and because no more like st- i think that's the reason why okay i'm going off point and talking about a country that doesn't really concern me china of course but like i feel that's why the ccp is getting legitimacy they cannot like they've done so much that even though people do not feel like their system is right would you collapse everything that they've built in the safe for the sake of a revolution like if they had gone through their precarious years of the like 60s and 70s and other situations where like it was bad enough that it could lead a revolution but they've managed to like eke it out and i once i feel like once they've become all that a couple of generations have ever known the party as a whole because the party as a whole will have legitimacy in the fact that it's they can claim to be a democracy they, having their lead, regional leaders truly elected and if their regional leaders are truly elected then indirectly if somebody climbs the party ladder aggressively blah 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 shaking hands knowing people marrying different marrying women across families and uh, whatever and clients to the top technically if they started as a regional leader it is started as but eventually the regional leaders will definitely become dynasties without question it's be a family affair another situation but if they started as a duly elected regional leader where the options even though the options are coming from within one singular party if they start as if all eventual overarching leaders start as all overarching leaders start as regional leaders Technically, the people voted for them and then they would be a democracy. A weird democracy, but a true democracy. And that makes sense. I feel that, I feel that is, they will reach their legitimacy. But the thing is, as weak middling countries, but I feel, I don't know, I'm deluding myself that Nigeria is at the point that we are too large for them to allow us to be a dictatorship. Like, we are too useful on the African continent, at least on, in West Africa, for, for them to allow us to be a dictatorship. Like, yes, we are currently at that weird, precarious situation because like, instead of voter suppression and, like, encouraging... Instead of, like, voters... Uh, like, our methods of voter suppression in Nigeria are, like, ballot stealing and threatening and maybe... Like, we have... We are currently in a mix of dictatorship methods and, um... Uh, what do you call it? It's stable democracy methods. There's obviously, like, slandering, fake news and all those things on an individual, but it's still, like towards the ballot stealing and whatever and over the last election i feel like mostly they used like um voter suppression and um aggressive popularity like popularity of either like based on this is our person based on rallying and all those things to get like actual votes and maybe like election rigging and other situation but it was generally less violent methods than we are used to like which is yeah like I feel I don't know maybe it's because I stayed in my house, but there was less news of of murder of murder in our last election, and I feel but twenty twenty three seems like it's going to be hot. But in the end, it might end up being quiet because I was freaking out about our last election, and maybe our, everything will collapse. But I don't think so. I feel we should if they push forward for eastern or southwestern governance, but if whatever they push forward, because um our um, our way of ensuring stability is by having a three major tribe thing in quotes 
But if they push for stability, or if they push for Eastern governance, I don't know how it's going to go, but like, yeah, that's prob- they're probably going to push for it and it'll be fine. Because I remember like all these, I remember all these ads when I was like, I, I ate, these ads will forever stay in my mind. And there's like all the regions of this, I remember this ad on AIT, this political ad, all the regions of Nigeria have become um, presidents. They have produced a president. And they wanted to be like, oh, the South South has never had a president and blah, 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 blah. And that's how they presented good luck. And everybody voted for him because, I don't know, it seemed like logical sense that, well, everybody, every region should have a chance to have a head of state. It doesn't mean, I don't know, it, that doesn't mean like you have capabilities or whatever. And then again, in this entire thing, I have say like someone being a sun king, like, you don't necessarily need to have capabilities to rule. It's just that because if you're a highly capable person surrounded by fucking idiots, like like all your capabilities use this. So it's the question of do you have like a board that knows what they are doing, what they want to achieve? And if you do, well, it's fine. Well, I don't know. This has kind of given me hope. For some reason I've gotten to an hour where I thought I didn't I wouldn't have anything to say. I should probably try and edit this thing, which I probably won't, and end up getting no views at all. But he has been a personal code of conduct. I wonder if the name CGP Gray is going to take get me anything. But just know that I have hope. I have hope. I have fucking hope. But this is so weird how a cynical thing kind of. But like I will, of course, have my plan B. I'm an individual getting into tech, getting into the financial service industry, and I think maybe that would, if, like, Nigeria doesn't show any signs of stability anytime soon, well, because you can stay in that middling level for a long period of time so far the key players are satisfied. That's the thing. You can stay in that middling level so far the key players are satisfied. I remember this key thing I, I, I learned in the office recently. Where somebody was like, if anybody tells you that sustainability is expensive, they are bullshitting you. It's a question of, do you want to do it or not? It's like, is it profitable? Like, for sustainability can give you like zero bottom line, but it's, it's a question of, is it profitable? Because doing the right thing doesn't necessarily mean that you, you will go through issues or your economy will or like your you it costs you unnecessary expenses that's just bullshit that everybody just lied about i don't know if i'm going to keep this but he has been a personal code of conduct have a lovely day or a lovely week bye